magic is very practical. It's very what you have on hand, what your natural environment is going to provide to you. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel and for today's video we're going to be talking about folk magic and folk practice. What is folk magic? Now you may have seen this term kind of being used very heavily at the moment on social media and even books are being printed with the term folk magic, folk craft, folk practice, folk practitioners. I myself am now using and identifying with this word and you might be kind of confused as to what it even means, what it encompasses, where the term comes from. And yeah, so this video is kind of a brief introduction to folk magic. I'm also going to be listing and sharing my current favorites on readings, so books for example. Yeah, so I hope this video is going to be somewhat linear. <laughs> I might be jumping around a little bit just because it is quite a large concept. I'm trying to talk about folk magic and folk practice in a more anthropological sense. Hopefully that kind of gives it a more, like hopefully that's better. Is the light weird? Hold on. Is that better? That's better, right? So I do have my notes over here, I have my laptop, so if I glance down every once in a while just know that that's my notes. <laughs> but yeah, so what is folk magic? Now I really liked Ronald Hutton, his definition of it is popular service magic. So what does that mean? What is it? What's the point of it? Essentially folk magic is the magic of the people. Now usually commoner people. So really if you want to get into it or even if you just want to have a very brief kind of understanding of it, there's two types of magic. You've got higher magic and lower magic, ceremonial magic and folk magic. So that's for example quoting Ronald Hutton, Scott Cunningham mentions that as well as the kind of you know a um, couple of different authors and a couple of different historians will refer to magic being either higher or lower, higher being ceremonial magic and lower being folk magic. So historically speaking this is interesting because higher magic used to, as I just said, be kind of more ceremonial magic and kind of was pre preserved, used more by nobility, for example, or people that just had more leisure time. It usually involved summoning of spirits and things like uh, astrology, uh, even alchemy, things like that could have at least back then, be kind of considered more higher magic, ceremonial magic. You may know, for example, casting a circle or, you know, things like that, though that does also to a degree exist in folk magic. There definitely is a bit of a blend. We've got kind of like, you know, the pie chart, part, no, not a pie chart. What is it called when there's two circles overlapping each other? that. <laughs> so you've got ceremonial and you've got folk and then there's a little bit of a blurriness going on there too. Now folk magic specifically I find interesting because it is so prevalent now. Um, it has existed and has been used as a word for really long time. However, it's kind of only recently popped up uh, and become popular in at least social media, in pub um, publishing nowadays. And why is that? I feel like a lot of people also are kind of discovering it now and being like, oh my gosh, uh, that resonates so much. It feels like coming home, you know? And chances are, yeah, because folk magic is full of folklore. It's full of fairy tales a lot of times and it's very localized. So the main difference between that I personally would say between ceremonial magic and folk magic is how individual folk magic is and usually tends to be. So it really is kind of something that evolves with time where ceremonial magic tends to be more of a tradition that gets passed down and it goes more by the book. You've got certain steps, you've got certain tools and things like that, whereas folk magic is much more just kind of what's available, what is current, the people that are around you, traditions that get passed down. Usually it's tied much more to land, ancestry and culture. And in some way, everyone practices folk magic. You might have just not realized it. It's a very 
popular <laughs> um, a way of doing and practicing. However, obviously not everyone wants to necessarily identify as a folk witch, that's up to you. But it does resonate with a lot of people because of how familiar a lot of it is. So, for example, I am German, so for me folk magic, I tie it back to German folk magic, right? You have things like fairy tales that kind of are like included, you know, you've got folklore of your surroundings. Um, my family being from Bavaria, I'm going to have things that are local to Bavarian uh, lore and traditions. And so you've got a lot of kind of uh, environmental things coming up with folk magic and that is obviously very like that it resonates with people because people feel like they can actually personalize folk magic they feel like um it's very individual once again and again we have that element of ancestry coming up a lot of times too and once again that's just a very personal approach to witchcraft practicing and i feel like it creates a feeling of um, hominess. The thing with folk magic also is that it looks different from region to region. Um, you don't really have one set of folk magic, whereas for example Wicca, which is ceremonial magic, is going to look the same or very similar across the board. You're going to have the same sort of rituals, you're going to have similar tools and similar steps and similar practices with Wicca. Whereas with folk magic, it's going to differ vastly from German folk magic to Italian folk magic to English, Scottish, even regional areas. It just is incredibly versatile and cultural specific. Uh, I would even argue that there is a big difference between, for example, German folk magic and American German folk magic. So, for example, people that have ancestral ties to Germany practicing folk magic in America. It's going to once again be different than if you actually lived in Germany just because the environment is different and you already have usually your own set of traditions, right? Depending on when your family emigrated to the United States. So what I find, especially out of an anthropological perspective, very, very fascinating. Oh, I hope you can't hear that. <laughs> um, is how much it evolves. Now, it is not stagnant at all. It very much evolves. It's very much a, a living tradition because of how humans just are. Uh, as soon as you have a new generation, things are gonna be done a little bit differently. And that's good, we want that. We don't want to necessarily hold on to everything in the past. Not everything in the past is great and we shouldn't glorify to the degree that we do a lot of times, in my personal opinion. Um, <laughs> whereas, you know, sometimes bringing in new things is very healthy and we create a shift otherwise if it doesn't evolve and if it's not alive it's going to die out eventually because it's just not relevant to us and our societies anymore whereas if it's evolving and it shifts and moves and lives with us it's going to be prevalent for every future generation essentially so folk magic specifically is also an interesting one it can sometimes feel a little intimidating to get into because it's like well you know if it's so cultural specific where do you even begin to look now a lot of this word of mouth so you have a lot of lore that just gets passed down in families you have a lot of family um traditions but you also have cultural kind of traditions that just get passed down with time so for example you might have stories within your family or within your environment that just kind of like move and get passed along and things like that I think are great things to get started with and to look at. I also love fairy tales. I feel like fairy tales, especially if you're looking more continental Europe, are going to give you a lot of information about folk magic and folklore. Usually fairy tales contain a lot of magic as is and sometimes they will even contain elements of old pagan stories, for example, right? A great example of this is Frau Holle or Lady Holle, um, which are these, which is the story of the elderly lady um, with the two girls, the, I don't know how you translate it in English, Goldmarie and Pechmarie. So it is the, um, the golden girl and the unlucky girl, let's say, where Frau Holle or Mother Holle actually is a old 
pagan kind of deity. Now things like that will kind of remain in stories even though we have Christianization that came along we do still have a lot of folklore that preserved itself through fairy tales and word of mouth and just living traditions especially within countrysides usually. A great book on this is actually Ronald Hutton's uh, latest book, um, Goddesses of Europe. Goddesses of Europe? I'm not sure exactly on the title, I'll put it on the screen, um, that I'm currently actually reading, I'm like halfway through, so I'm gonna do a review of that at some point. But the thing with it is a lot of times, and that is where I think a lot of people kind of get confused or they're curious about it, is that because it evolves and because of Christianization and it being kind of like passed down with word of mouth, you actually oftentimes get an element of mixing paganism or old kind of traditions of a culture with Christianity. So a lot of times, depending on the region, once again, um, you may have less or more elements of Christianity that kind of come through. A great example of this is Italian folk magic, where you really have a lot of like saint veneration and things like that. Even in German folk magic, you're going to see several elements of, for example, um, Mother Mary being kind of worked with much more. Now, personally, I don't, just because personal views, <laughs> I guess. But, for example, um, Gemma Gary talks about this in The Black Toad, where a lot of the charms and a lot of the prayers that are spoken in these folk charms are Christian prayers. Now, Gemma Gary mentions that it's more so done for the client rather than necessarily because the practitioner themselves are Christian or believe in that, but because of Christianization, a lot of people were obviously more, much more comfortable um, with Christian elements rather than the old heathen elements. So therefore, pagan prayer kind of turned into Christian prayer. However, interestingly enough, a lot of those Christian prayers still will include elements of old kind of paganism, mentions of, for example, the wild hunt or mentions of certain symbolism that can be tied back to the leaves of pagan sort of elements, right? When I'm speaking about pagan, by the way, I'm speaking about specific European paganism, not the umbrella term of paganism. Most of our evidence of folk magic is going to be, as I mentioned, word of mouth rather than written. Now, that again comes mostly because it is common folk magic rather than uh, upper class kind of magic, right? Ceremonial magic, we have great records because they used to be practiced more by nobility or people with a lot of free time, which used to be people that have more money or more resources or are just higher in like the societal hierarchy. Whereas folk magic is very much common folk kind of magic. Usually um, it would be, for example, common um, like a wise woman or cunning folk that would be in the knowledge of these ways and they would provide the service to the people. Usually that would be with payments, oftentimes charms for protection, charms for um, creating food for the family or a lot of times even medicinal kind of things. So if someone was having ailments of the body, they would oftentimes go to one of these folk practitioners that would help them with whatever their physical ailments were. A curious one that I think is very, very funny is the prevalence of warts and being struck by lightning. Um, <laughs> if you've ever read Gemma Gary, uh, especially the black, black Toad, you're gonna see a lot of warts and being struck by lightning. Um, because once again, it is more common folk. Things were not necessarily written down as much. So you're gonna have a lot of things being passed down, usually in the family, or you had a mentor mentor that kind of passed things on to the next generation. You also are usually, especially now, heavy on UPG. UPG stands for Unverified Personal Gnosis, and is your personal relationship and findings within the craft. Now, for example, things like that can include plant lore, where there is a common plant lore, and then if you work with that plant specifically, you might find that it does really well in love magic, whereas usually it's only really associated with 
protection, for example, right? So that's your personal UPG. And a lot of folklore is going to be very personalized. And once again, this is very enticing to a lot of people, but it does create that sort of personal path. And that is how it evolves. So if UPG kind of, you know, gets brought on to um, many new generations at some point it's going to be recognized by enough people it's going to turn into verified gnosis so that is something that is keeping the traditions alive and will then you know with time kind of evolve that does mean that it is sometimes hard for us to really understand how things were done in the past besides things that we have just found like hard evidence things like shoes and walls or which bottles have been discovered you know from like the 16th or 17th century because so much is word of mouth it can be hard to trace back now things we we can definitely kind of assume are that it's going to be very heavy on herbology it's going to be definitely heavy on animal lore usually ancestry and it's usually very centered on the hearth and home sorry i was glancing down quite a bit there herbology specifically to your region once again folklore is very environmental dependent so if you live somewhere for example your your practice is going to look very different if you live in florida versus if you live in where i live in latvia right um, it's going to be very different because the environment is incredibly different the plants are different the animals are different the lore is going to therefore be different the history is very different so you're going to have all those elements kind of coming into your folk magic and into your practice so therefore and that is why i think it's very important to make certain distinguishments such as for example oh i am a English folk practitioner versus an American English because someone who grew up in America and practices kind of traditional practices that were preserved through family or they are reconnecting with ancestry it's gonna still look different than if you actually lived in England simply because your plants are different your animals are going to be different and it doesn't always translate right so if you've got a lot of plants surrounding you that just do not exist in England, you're going to have to look at either creating your own connection and UPG or what are local beliefs about this plant, for example, that you are encountering here. Animal lore is an interesting one as well. We've got a lot of animal lore and again, I feel like animal lore is a very specifically interesting case of culturally, it's going to be very different where some cases, you know, we have, for example, the snake. In some cultures, the snake is regarded as a good omen and in some cases it's not. So therefore, your practice is going to once again be very personal, very unique. Now we have the hearth and home. The hearth and home is very important to a folk practitioner because that is where your magic comes from. It's where you take your rest. It's where you recharge. And in my opinion, folk magic should always be inclusive of your hearth, of your home, and also the land spirits and the home spirits right where you live. Just because that's where you're working from and you would want to, in my opinion at least, maybe this is my UPG, you know, um, but I feel like it is a good practice kind of to just work with your spirits that are local and that are going to be there and best to help you in your workings. It just to me, it makes the most sense. Obviously, if you completely disagree because of where you live and maybe, you know, there's there are certain different, different various reasons, right, that you might not want to work with local spirits, that's up to you, obviously. But a lot of times you do have that element of local spirits, local local animals that you might want to work with or to the very least research about and learn about and see how that animal may have been regarded in folklore previously. The folk magic and practices, as I said, they're going to tie in a lot of folk folklore, uh, fairy tales and superstitions. So that is another revenue, revenue that you can really go down with if you are new and you're kind of wanting to research a very specific region if you are wanting to reconnect to maybe your ancestral kind of folk magic then i really recommend learning about the folk tales fairy tales and superstitions of that region 
um, that's going to give you like an insight into what these type of people used to and still believe in. I know there's for example a search in people from the United States wanting to kind of reconnect with European countries and cultures and I think it's very important to learn these type of things to really kind of connect and understand the people um, from back then but also to recognize that these cultures still exist, they're still alive and you can still see how these people interact and the things that they believe in. Another thing that I think this is maybe a little bit controversial, I don't think it's controversial but perhaps perhaps someone might think so. I think it's very important to actually get to know your environment and to get out of the house and connect with nature. I see folk magic and folk practicing or practitioners as being quite connected to nature just because it is so localized and you're going to usually work with what you've got. A lot of folk magic is very practical, it's very what you have on hand, what your natural environment is going to provide to you, those are things that you're going to want to use. Personally I prefer to practice that way, I try not to really order things from across the world that are just not available to me normally or naturally. However, obviously that kind of depends on everything, right? It just depends on your accessibility of things. But I feel like simple magic and magic that is kind of just the things that nature gives you already. That's really for me what I think folk magic is and that's how I see my practice. So it's very localized, it's very specific to where I live. Now I live in Latvia, however I kind of tie back to German practices, however because of the history of Latvia you find a lot of that here and you, I do tie in a couple of things that you know my fiance for example kind of tells me and things like that. It just really depends on, on you personally. Um, another thing that I want to quickly kind of go um, and discuss is the importance of language. Now language is a type of gatekeeper, meaning if you know a language it's going to open up so many doors for you and knowing a language it takes time. It's usually not the easiest thing to accomplish. It takes time, it takes resources, but if you have the availability and you're wanting to reconnect with a certain folk magic of a certain culture or region that is not English speaking or whichever one it is maybe you know and let's take German for example right it is so incredibly important in my opinion to know German if you want to reconnect with it because you're gonna miss out on a lot of context. Google Translate it can give you a glimpse but it's like looking through a little bit of a window and sometimes I would even say that window is a little blurry. So the importance of language is really really interesting and I feel like this is maybe something that is frustrating for certain people because it, it just does take a lot of time and resources. But if you are able to, I really think learning the language is going to be just an entire game changer because of context. As I said, Google Translate, for example, you know, you kind of understand maybe the like the words, but you're not gonna understand the meaning because a lot of times we've got phrases in languages that or sayings, things like that, you know, that you're gonna need to understand context to be able to really understand the meaning of what is being said. Now this will take time and to be honest with you, in my opinion witchcraft is something that does just take time. I don't think you can learn witchcraft in a month or two and I don't think you're you're going to learn a language necessarily in a month or two. Another thing that I immediately noticed is that how many doors it just opens to you in actually learning. I have this book right here. I, I'm just gonna have to hold this real quick because otherwise the books are gonna fall over. So this is Hans-Peter Dua, Traumzeit über die Grenze zwischen Wildnis und Zivilisation. Um, and this book, I think it was eight euros. Or, or maybe it was 12 euros or something like that. This book, I first initially Googled it in English and it was 120 euros. Um, in German, it's around 10 euros. So 
let me just put it back real quick. So language just opens so many doors for researching folklore, for researching magic essentially, right? And why wouldn't you want that? Now, a question that I got that I think is an interesting thing to discuss is what is the difference between folk magic and witchcraft? Now, in all honesty, I do think that right now we're kind of using the word folk magic and folk practitioner because it is a little bit of a trendy word, let's say. But it's not necessarily that it is trendy, it is that we kind of are now like we discovered it or it became more popular because of publishing, because, you know, certain certain authors just used it more, started using it more. And I think it is justified because I feel like it is more accurate to what we mean when we talk about witchcraft. Because witchcraft to a certain degree implies that people identify as a witch um, or that people practice witchcraft with very certain sort of usually you have like an image in your mind whereas if you practice folk magic or you're a folk practitioner that doesn't necessarily evoke the same kind of things and it doesn't necessarily mean the same so whilst you might you know do very similar kind of rituals a folk practitioner is going to look a little different and it's kind of a more niche label it's kind of i would almost say witchcraft is a bit of an umbrella term because witchcraft can also mean ceremonial magic um or of course folk magic it's going to be kind of more all-encompassing of higher and lower magic if you want to talk about traditional witchcraft and folk magic um, or folk practitioners now those are very very closely related in my opinion the main thing I would still say and make an argument for is a traditional witch and traditional witchcraft whilst it's very very similar and very closely related to folk witchcraft or folk magic or folk practitioners um, a folk practitioner is still going to be working more localized now it's in the name in my opinion folk practitioner your folk not to be confused with the folkish movement um stay away from that but a folk practitioner is going to be working much more within their community and i think that's a really really important aspect so folk practitioners usually do work with the community especially historically speaking again it was commoners service magic or commoners service practice where they provided a service for their community and they they were known by their community to be helpful or um you know where you would go for assistance for certain things traditional witchcraft in my opinion doesn't imply that level of service or community necessarily where you are possibly much more solitary and you're possibly going to have a more a practice that isn't as localized a practice that does not necessarily include as much ancestry and um, environmental kind of uh, culture it's just going to have little differences that I think they're difficult to grasp sometimes, yes, but once you kind of, maybe it's one of those things where if you practice it and you kind of start, you know, working, you're going to start noticing it more. Um, traditional witchcraft doesn't necessarily, it can, but it doesn't necessarily include the same levels of folk lore, right? As folk practitioners. Folk practitioners, in my opinion at least, are just much more heavy on the local kind of superstitions, lore, practices, right? Kind of what impacted that specific culture. May that be Christianity, may that be certain fairy tales and stories and even familiar kind of family ties that just, they're not going to be the same for everyone. Whereas traditional witchcraft, tends to be not so heavy on those specific things. So, I think, I think, I hope <laughs> that this was a not all too confusing introduction to folk magic and folk practitioners, practitioners, folk practitioners um, and what it is. So now for a couple of books that I want to highlight. Let me get them out for you. The first one and possibly one of my favorite books 
all time is Plants of the Devil by Corinne Boyer. Now, this one is amazing. <laughs> I love it. I love Corinne Boyer in general. But this is such an amazing book. It contains so much folklore about plants specifically um, and how they were used and how they were regarded. And it's very cultural. Once again, she, um, Corinne Boyer does kind of mention a couple of different, so um, for example, German, English, even Russian in here and how people also worked at illustrations are so nice how people would work with different um plants especially for example the devil's garden so it's going to include a lot more plants that were used for both baneful as well as healing um, workings a lot of times and um, people don't really realize that they kind of go hand in hand so yeah i love this book definitely pick this up if you've got the opportunity to another one that i really really love is jamagiri the black toad now this one is very specific to i believe devon um, devonshire and more west country so west of england and it's very heavy on actual charms and actual prayers and things like that there's a great introduction as well but this one is going to really just be a great sort of reading for if you're actually curious what it looks like like what does folk magic look like this one is excellent now i know that this one is a little bit harder for americans to get um for me this was 18 pounds because I actually was in England and bought this there. But I know if you buy it over Troy Books, they have a website. It, it, it might be cheaper than if you have to buy it some other place. But yeah, great book. Anything by Gemma Gary is going to be really, really good for folk magic, folklore, um, folk, folk witchcraft in general. I am going to blatantly self-promote myself here. My book, <laughs> The Book of Spells, is actually quite inclusive of folk practices and folk charms so i do have a couple of folk spells in here or um folk magic let's say so if you are curious this one definitely is more focused on my personal sort of folk magic so specific kind of to germany and there's like one or two latvian inspired ones um <laughs> so yeah this one and then one more, one second, I'll go grab it. One more that I am currently reading. Now I haven't finished it yet, um, but it is Queens of the Wild. That's the name. So Pagan Goddesses in Christian Europe um, by Ronald Hutton. In general, Ronald Hutton is an excellent source for all things witchcraft. I've got a couple of his books over here. And this one in particular, I love so much already. It kind of questions a couple of things I feel like that we kind of have taken for granted or it's a, sometimes misconceptions and Ronald Hutton is really kind of like discussing a lot of things in here that I am like oh <laughs> you know so this one is a really really great one for you to pick up as well and yeah I will leave them linked below in the description box as well now if you have any other questions you're welcome to obviously comment those but yeah, so um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, I hope it wasn't like too all over the place. And with that being said, thank you so much for watching and I'll talk to you soon. Let's be, bye.